Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to cover the history of JavaScript from my perspective, which begins with the Mosaic web browser. Initially released in 1993, Mosaic did not include support for JavaScript, but it did have a cool spinny globe. It also gained some traction, as we see in this 94 Wired Magazine article that says, Prodigy, AOL, and CompuServe are all suddenly obsolete and Mosaic is well on its way to becoming the world's standard interface. In 94, James Clark and Mosaic co-author Mark Andreessen found Netscape in order to market web browsers, and in 95, they hired Brendan Eich in order to build a scripting language to incorporate in the browser and in web pages to make web pages interactive. Famously, he states that this language was originally created in just 10 days. And uh, in a co-branding effort with Sun, they named this scripting language JavaScript and also modified the language somewhat to appear like Java, although Java and JavaScript are very different languages. Netscape Navigator comes out in late 95 slash early 96 for the low, low price of $49. And also very early on in these days, Netscape is already marketing the idea of server-side JavaScript, so you can use JavaScript on the server as well as on the client. I had an employer around Y2K that uh, actually use server-side JavaScript in their software and at the time I thought they were crazy. Back to uh, the client in 1996, Internet Explorer 3 comes out from Microsoft to support for Java and JavaScript. They call it JScript to avoid trademark issues. They also support VBScript on the client and on the server uh, where we first initially see the idea of using different languages in the browser. Although most people did not use BASIC at this time, they used JavaScript. Back in these days, the term for these uh, web pages that were interactive was dynamic HTML as opposed to a static document. Call it DHTML for short. Notice here this reference to ECMAScript as opposed to JavaScript because by this time, even already in 1997, we had the first ECMAScript standard from the ECMA standards body where Netscape and Microsoft and others could get together and cooperate on what they're going to call a standard here. ECMA 262 is the standard uh, uh, number and ECMAScript is the name they gave it in order to avoid again trademark issues. In 98 we get second edition, in 99 we get third edition including regular expressions and try catch blocks among other new features in the standard. Back in 98 Netscape was purchased by AOL because AOL did see itself becoming obsolete and uh, the idea here also perhaps this extra infusion of cash helped Netscape compete with Microsoft in their web browser space uh, which didn't necessarily work out so well but that's what happened. Uh, in 2003, Mozilla Foundation was spun out from AOL Netscape. Uh, already the idea of the Mozilla project and uh, organization was internal inside of AOL Netscape. In fact, the original uh, Netscape Navigator browser project internally had the codename of Mozilla, which was a combination of Mosaic and Godzilla. In any case, by now we get Mozilla Foundation as a unique entity, having already released Mozilla 1.0 in 2002. And by 2004, we have Firefox 1.0. Firefox is still with us today, though evolved quite a bit. In terms of the spread of the JavaScript language out to other kinds of environments, we see uh, JavaScript inspired languages on .NET common language runtime, such as JScript.NET. And we also see Unity Script from the Unity game engine inspired by JavaScript. But the one I want to talk about actually goes back a little bit in history to 1996 with a company called Future Wave and Future Splash Animator. They were purchased early on by Macromedia, which renamed this product to Flash, and this is where the Flash player comes from. Adobe acquired Macromedia in 2005. In any case, the vector graphic animation tools that were in Flash, people want those to be interactive as well for making games, among other types of things. And back in 2000, we have ActionScript 1.0 inspired by JavaScript and ECMAScript. They're not fully compatible. In 2003, we have ActionScript 2.0. In 2006, we have ActionScript 3.0. ActionScript 2 included class syntax and static typing, which JavaScript did not have at the time. And also, this is the era in which the hacks language is born, inspired by ActionScript. And it's a great language we will not have time to discuss today. ActionScript 3 had various goals, including performance, which is what I want to focus on, because along with it, they had the ActionScript Virtual Machine 2, or AVM2 for short. This virtual machine specification did not require JIT compiling to native code, but it did support it. And so when we have classes and static typing and a JIT compiling virtual machine, all of a sudden, basically, uh, we have ActionScript competing on the same scale as Java or C Sharp, which is very interesting, and in fact, Adobe uh, made a co-project with Mozilla they called the Tamarin Project where they open source portions of their AVM2 virtual machine with the idea of having the same virtual machine existing in web browsers and in the Flash player and making JavaScript competitive with C Sharp and Java. 
this uh, ECMAScript 4 proposal for the language, which is going to be very heavily inspired by ActionScript. Uh, ideally, they were going to be releasing as early as 2002. Uh, this particular proposal is 2003. And even by 2007, we see that this is not finalized. In fact, it never was finalized. ECMAScript 4th edition is not existing because there were, uh, was a lack of consensus on the part of the players in the TC39 committee. Uh, Microsoft, for strategic and technical reasons, was against it. And also we have Doug Crockford from Yahoo arguing, primarily from a technical perspective, that ES4 was not the right thing to do with ECMAScript, that is sort of jumping the shark in a sense. And so we get this notion later on of uh, ECMAScript Harmony coming out. The idea is how are we going to get together and actually agree on the language going forward. Uh, this discussion here we see from a blog post from John Rezig of jQuery fame. Uh, the idea is they're going to make a small update to the language called ES 3.1 and then work out this harmony methodology whereby they could evolve the language going forward. Uh, so ECMAScript 5, 3.1 they never called it, they decided to call it 5 to make it clear that 4 was dead. came out in 2009, 10 years after ES 3, and then we get more substantial changes under the harmony uh, project by 2015 with ES6, also called ES Harmony. And since uh, 2015, we see new releases on the dot every year because by now, the new way of organizing and evolving uh, the language has become very pragmatic and streamlined. Uh, sixth edition, ES6, came out with class syntax, a module import syntax, arrow functions, let for sane local variable declarations. In 2016, we get await and async. In 2018, we have rest spread operators. And overall, the language has been moving rather quickly recently. Uh, you can go to the TC39 proposals uh, uh, repository at GitHub and see all kinds of things about what's coming up and or already standardized in the language. Now, meanwhile, in terms of what's JavaScript going to be used for, is it just for doing cool effects on mouse overs and stuff, or do you actually write more serious applications in it? And this started changing around the time of Gmail's release. A browser user interface that trumps many desktop apps, here's how they did it. That was 2004. In 2005, Google Maps comes out uh, with uh, dragging around and zooming in and out inside of your web page for this uh, to look at maps, which was basically unheard of at the time and uh, made people reconsider what JavaScript and DHTML could be used for. It also starts using this notion of AJAX here, what started being called. This is a term coined asynchronous JavaScript plus XML or AJAX, termed in 2005 by Jesse James Garrett, describes a quote unquote new approach, quote unquote new, because really the idea of writing client applications that talk data with a server is not really a new idea, but is rather new to being widespread acceptance in uh, web development. Uh, this uses the XML HTTP request object, originally designed by Microsoft, but by now supported in all the major web browsers. And XML does, is not required for XML HTTP request or AJAX. It becomes sort of a misnomer. And over time, JSON or JSON, JavaScript object notation, becomes more popular. Uh, the idea is that this language, which is a subset, or at least close to a subset of JavaScript, is still human readable, yet simpler to work with for data transfer. Uh, and famously includes the grammar on its home page as a way of emphasizing its simplicity. Now, also, if we're going to write applications, it's nice to have useful libraries, such as, and this is our first wave of major JavaScript libraries in these times. You know, Dojo, MochiKit, Yahoo User Interface, Scriptaculous, Prototype, jQuery, and more. Scriptaculous, it's about the user interface, baby. Uh, jQuery probably won back in these days of this round of... Uh, of JavaScript libraries and frameworks, and in fact, certain features popularized by jQuery found their way in various forms into uh, DOM APIs. And also, if we're going to write applications in JavaScript, maybe we should learn how to use JavaScript correctly. So Doug Crockford, we see here again in 2008, he has his book, JavaScript, the Good Parts, which basically argues that if you ignore the bad things you know from this 10-day language original development, there's a lot of good things in it as well that you can use to do quality uh, application development. Now, also, if we're going to have JavaScript writing applications, the question is, how well does JavaScript perform as a runtime? And we're going to start this story back in with KHTML, the uh, web rendering engine uh, originally designed for the KDE desktop environment in 1998. In early 2000s, uh, this open source engine is forked by Apple and released as WebKit uh, open source form in 2005. The idea is this could be used in their Safari web browser, but also embedded in other applications. One of those applications later was Google Chrome, which came out in 2008. Originally, Google Chrome was primarily built on WebKit with a few key components swapped out, including the JavaScript engine. They had their own engine, V8, 
which was basically saying, we're not going to change what JavaScript is. We're going to leave it a dynamic and dynamically typed language. However, we're going to be able to figure out how to optimize it and JIT compile it to native code and make it somewhat competitive with Java or C Sharp without changing the language internals. And other people took notice of this. We get Mozilla's uh, are we fast yet .com website. Here we see over the space of a few months in 2010 that they uh, drastically improved their performance of their JavaScript engine on these particular benchmarks. Are we fast .com exists today, though it looks quite different by now. And also we have the idea of saying, hey, if we have some great JavaScript runtimes out there, we can use it for more than just inside of web browsers. Ryan Dahl in 2009 uh, creates Node.js. Uh, with the idea of JavaScript everywhere, JavaScript on the client as well as the server. This goes back to you know the notion of that server-side JavaScript, only this time it does take off in a serious way. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, web server frameworks out there for writing your uh, server applications, including ExpressJS and many more I cannot get into. Also, since uh, JavaScript famously designed for embedding and therefore does not have a large standard library, uh, the idea is you might still want to have lots of uh, support code in order to write applications. And so Node Package Manager comes out in 2010, or NPM for short. And there are various other package managers that come out along the way as well, which we cannot get into. Um, also, the idea is if you have these libraries, you might want to bundle them up for good delivery to the client or wherever you might want them at. Grunt is one of the famous builders along the way. Probably the most popular today is Webpack, but there are many others, including Parcel, that say we should make it simpler to uh, uh, describe how you're going to bundle things together. And we also have a new round of JavaScript framework libraries coming out at, with Angular around 2010. There's also React, Vue, Svelte, and many others. Probably most popular today is React, where they have made their own custom uh, non-standardized extensions to the JavaScript language. They call it JSX, which allows you to embed XML directly into your JavaScript. The idea is easier to uh, describe HTML user interfaces this way. Now with the whole everything old is new again kind of notion going on here we've seen multiple times. There actually already was a standard as early as 2004 for uh, including XML in your JavaScript called uh, E4X, which does let you describe XML, put it directly inside of your JavaScript, as well as query your JavaScript. This did not take off at the time, however. It is mostly defunct today, although JSX is somewhat popular. Now, with all this stuff going on and many things I haven't mentioned, there's also this idea of JavaScript fatigue. How do we keep up with all the things happening? And this does bother some people. Uh, personally, I like to liken the idea of JavaScript fatigue to the singularity. And there's some backlash. You go to vanillajs.com, which is sort of fun. All these things you might want to have in your JavaScript framework, click them on whatever you check or uncheck. It's always going to be zero bytes uncompressed because the argument here is JS already has what you need it to have. But most people do uh, include dependencies, at least very many people do. And uh, we have the, this leads to the famous uh, left pad debacle of 2016, where the register describes it as sort of the Jenga tower of JavaScript comes tumbling down. Uh, someone pulled this left pad package. Uh, because of not common support uh, out there in these bundlers for uh, uh, fancy linking that can include just what you needed, people got in the habit of creating very small packages, including left pad that just pads strings on the left side. And uh, then there's a lot of transitive dependencies where when that package got pulled, a lot of other uh, things on NPM stopped working. And it was up within a day or so, it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth and led to lots of questions of how do we prevent this in the future. One of the answers to this was ES 2017 included string padding support. Now, there's lots of other complaints you can make about JavaScript of the ID, and then it was developed so quickly and therefore had maybe had lots of mistakes in it. You can visit WTFJS uh, repo on GitHub and see all kinds of potential complaints. And a lot of people are actually feeling locked in by this point. Why do I have to code in this JavaScript language what a hack it is? The JavaScript phenomenon is mass psychosis. Will JavaScript die in the future? JavaScript must die. The alternative perspective to this is always bet on JS, a phrase that Brendan Eich became famous for saying. Uh, he says, basically, uh, independent of what you might want to complain about it, just empirical evidence shows it's working and it's getting people's jobs done and it's growing. Uh, of course, there's several different perspectives on this as well. Always bet on JS as complete nonsense versus keep betting on JavaScript as late as 2019 here. But in case you don't like JavaScript, the language to write code in, uh, we also start getting the notion of JavaScript as an assembly language, or in other words, a compile, compiler target. Uh, one of the earliest popular uh, cases of compiling to JavaScript was Google Web Toolkit, or GWT, which compiled Java to JavaScript. Then you could just use your Java IDE with your autocomplete and your static typing support and create an efficient JavaScript bundle when you were done. 
Uh, another popular language along the way is CoffeeScript. came out in 2009 with the idea that it's not going to change the semantics of JavaScript very much, but give you perhaps a nicer way to approach it from a syntax perspective. Many languages compile to JavaScript today. Some of these are great languages, and we can't get into any of them at the moment, really. And you can also compile JavaScript to JavaScript. ES6 Harmony came out in 2015. All of cool new features, but you need to uh, ship to browsers that are old. And so because of that, you might want to be able to have a way to compile uh, from new features to old features, and Babel is a way of doing this. Also, we, in 2011, we have this leak in terms of how do we evolve JavaScript. We have this leak from uh, Google, where the announcement basically says, uh, we're wanting to replace JavaScript entirely with a new language called Dart. And a Dart engine is going to be more efficient and a better foundation than JavaScript is. And until such time as all the browsers support Dart natively, you can just use, com uh, compile Dart to JavaScript. This did not gain much traction. Another thing that has gained much more traction in terms of evolving JavaScript is this TypeScript language from uh, Microsoft that adds static typing, among other things, to uh, JavaScript. It's sort of like CoffeeScript. It doesn't try to change what JavaScript is, but it adds this notion that if you add certain features, such as static typing, you can scale to larger applications. The one-two punch along with TypeScript is the Visual Studio Code, or VS Code Editor, which is written in TypeScript and supports great TypeScript development, among other languages. And uh, it ships in uh, uh, an application framework called Electron, which basically you deliver your application as a Chromium web browser bundled inside of it. We'll not be able to get into all the different ways of uh, delivering native JavaScript applications to desktop or mobile today. Another language that compiles to JavaScript by this point is C and C++ through Emscripten and other ways. One of the uh, targets is this asm.js subset of JavaScript, which is designed to make it easy to compile efficiently uh, from this subset of JavaScript, asm.js, to native code in an ahead of time fashion. Although we don't see any updates to this after 2014 because people started working together on a binary specification called WebAssembly, which is rather independent of JavaScript entirely and can even be used outside of the browser and is supported in uh, all the major web browsers today. In terms of how developers are looking at this, both WebAssembly and TypeScript show up as fairly popular notions in the Stack Overflow 2019 uh, survey. And if we look at uh, some history over time here, GitHub pull requests, we'll see here, perhaps JavaScript popularity peaks on this particular metric in mid-2016, although it's interesting to note that TypeScript is already increasing in popularity by this time. If we add the two together, it might be more of a flat line since around 20, mid-2016 rather than decreasing. Where is JavaScript or TypeScript or WASM going in the future? Hard to say, but it'll be fun to see how it's going. See y'all later.